The Tom Woods Show, episode 2026. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you are surrounded by irrational, panicked people who think you're a terrible person because you don't want to lock everybody in their houses. No amount of reasoning appears to accomplish anything. And not to mention the media has done nothing but stoke fear and fail to provide context. Well, one of the many benefits you get as a supporter of The Tom Woods Show is membership inside The Tom Woods Show Elite. Recently migrated off Facebook, so if that was holding you back, no longer. This group will keep you sane and informed, and as an added bonus, it won't accuse you of wanting to kill your grandmother. Join me in there at supportinglisteners.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're joined today by Anne Hendershot, who is a professor of sociology and director of the Veritas Center for Ethics in Public Life at the Franciscan University of Steubenville in Steubenville, Ohio. She had an article not too long ago in the American Conservative magazine called The Return of the Postmodern Pedophile. Now, I guess it goes without saying that the subject matter here is appropriate for mature audiences only. And we're going to be talking about this because it's not in your imagination that there has been an effort to try to normalize pedophilia. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the origins of that and what's going on with it. So, Anne, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be on. I read your article, which I'm linking on our show notes page for this episode, uh, linking to it. And it confirmed, of course, a suspicion that I'd had, but I didn't know, I don't have the level of detail that you provided in the article. We've had a kind of an indication from one crazy quarter or another that there's some kind of weird effort to normalize pedophilia. And you think, well, these, this is horrible, but these must just be on the extreme fringes and even academia couldn't possibly sink this low. I mean, this has to be. And then I read your article and I thought, doggone it, why am I giving academia the benefit of the doubt? How could I, after all these years of observing it, have been so naive? So first of all, you use the word postmodern. I'll note, by the way, as a writer of many articles myself, that very often the, the headline for an article is not written by the author. But in your article, they have the word postmodern, postmodern pedophile. What makes him postmodern? Well, as you know, Foucault was the French postmodernist who tried to normalize all forms of deviance related to sexuality. And so he is a member of the postmodern school, the Frankfurt School. So we, we kind of think of it that way. And I think today's postmodern scholars, a lot of them they won't acknowledge that anything is right or anything is wrong. So even pedophilia can fall on a continuum of subjective ideas about whether it's right or wrong. And the postmodernists are always trying to redefine phenomenon and sexuality is number one in many of their lives. And so I call them postmodern pedophiles because they want to change the name. And that's what the article really addresses. When you start changing the name pedophile and taking that away, the pejorative implications of such a, a loaded word as pedophile are gone. And so about 15 years ago, I wrote a book called The Politics of Deviance, and it's all about deviant behavior. And at that time, the pedophiles were trying to change the name pedophilia to something called intergenerational intimacy. And it was postmodern scholars on college campuses that wrote a book lauding intergenerational intimacy. And then that went away. I mean, I published that book with Encounter, The Politics of Deviance, almost 20 years ago. But now it's back. And that's why I called my article The Return of the Postmodern Pedophile, because they've disregarded and thrown out the intergenerational intimacy words, and they've replaced it with something called minor attractive persons. So they're just nice people that are attracted to minors. They're just people like us, normal people who are attracted to minors. They're not pedophiles because they're not acting on it necessarily. You know, that's the part. So pedophiles gone again. It's I really, they, the postmodernists have always disliked that word. But they're called MAPS. They use the acronym MAPS, M-A-P-S, Minor Attractive Persons. And that's why I wrote the article. I recall uh, I was 
not born at the time, but I've watched a lot of old episodes of The Honeymooners. And of course, Ed Norton <laughs> worked in a sewer. And I remember there was a time when he referred to himself as an engineer in subterranean sanitation. <laughs> and we all, we all knew what he was doing. He was trying to prettify sewer worker. Yes. And so likewise, this is obviously much more serious. And yet it seems to me that of all the different steps the left has tried to take, to make this or that thing seem acceptable, or not not even seem acceptable, but to demand that everybody conform to agree with everybody else's lifestyle. It's not enough to say that we have to tolerate, we have to celebrate it, we have to do this and that. We can't just leave everybody alone, which is initially what they said they wanted. Then it turned out that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted to impose you know, whatever the latest thing is on everybody. But it seems like this is one where, although academia might go for it and might start using the term minor attracted persons and so on and so forth. It seems as if the the public resistance to this one is finally likely to be victorious. Don't, don't you think? I think so. But we still have to go through these transition periods. And I'm older than you are, Tom, so that I remember these early trends. Beginning in the 70s, 1970s, and I was not quite an academic yet, but I was in college, The North American Man-Boy Love Association was around, and they weren't a joke at the time. Now they're a joke on South Park, you know, everybody, ha, 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 but they're still around. I remember them from the 1980s. Yeah, I remember them in the 1980s, absolutely. And and, uh, this was just part of the landscape. Right. They were very much, they were big players in the gay community. And now the gay community is rejecting them, and good for them. They don't want any part of it, but they they were important part of the gay community pride movement. They were part of the annual pride parades. They had their own banners. They had their own floats. And they were proclaimed this man-boy love. But in the 1980 parade, there was a a little blip on their (laughs) progress forward as the lesbian feminists didn't want any part of them being part of the parade. And their organizing committee had been dominated by NAMBLA. And these women said, oh, no, I don't think so. And so... It was kind of a, a, a setback, a little bit of a setback, but not a huge setback. They were still part of the parade. I mean, the, the women couldn't get them out of the parade for several more years. It took years to do that. And to their credit, the gay community, the GLBTQ community, does not want to be any part of this. So I would never want anyone to think that I'm talking about the gay community. I'm really not. I'm talking about a subculture within it. That at one time was very much accepted by the gay community. Boy love was very much accepted, but the lesbian caucus kind of <laughs> had to shine a light on it so the rest of the world could see that, you know, hey, this is really wrong. This shouldn't be part of our parade here and our celebration. So that's kind of the history in the 70s. And then things got much worse in the 80s. And by the end of the 80s, Nambla was very much a deviant. I study deviants. I teach a course called Deviants, and we study what is deviant at a given time and what's not deviant and what's going to be deviant tomorrow, but won't be deviant today or yesterday because deviant changes. So by 1990, NAMBLA was pretty darn deviant. Even though the Journal of Homosexuality published a double issue that was devoted to adult child sex, man, boy, nobody's talking about man, girl sex here. I need to make that clear. And their, their double issue, the Journal of Homosexuality, was entitled Generational Intimacy. And the guy who was the head of the Gay Activist Alliance in New York, a man named David Thorstad, he wrote an article and he wrote that man-boy love occurs in every neighborhood today. And the movement continued, but it went underground because sometimes really bad things happen. And in Boston, there was a horrible case that resulted in the death of a 10-year-old boy, these two, this couple, Charles James was one of the names of the couple. He was convicted of torturing, raping, and murdering a little 10-year-old Boston boy after accessing NAMBLA's writings at the public library. And so they traced it back to NAMBLA, and NAMBLA was hit with a $200 million wrongful death suit and civil rights lawsuit. I mean, he was convicted, but there was also a civil rights lawsuit. And so it was a big, and so it was a real setback for NAMBLA. And they never really recovered, I would have to say. But don't worry, there's plenty of other groups that are rushing in to take, and there's always academia. Academia is still a place 
and I don't want to say all of academia, but a lot of the subcultures within academia, faculty, there's this guy, Professor Ken Plummer, who's taught sociology. I'm a sociologist, so I kind of take this personally. He's taught sociology for more than 30 years in the UK at the University of Essex, and he studies these things, and he's part of the normalization movement. There was a professor at UCLA. This latest book, and I don't know if you have mentioned this to your listeners at all, this latest book, and the reason I wrote the article about this, is there was kind of a a brouhaha about this new book. And the book is called A Long Dark Shadow, Minor Attractive People and Their Pursuit of Dignity. It's by a a sociologist named Alan Walker. And he was teaching at Old Dominion University. And he wrote this book and he got a lot of attention for it. And people started getting a little concerned and really concerned as he went on Fox News and talked. I mean, he didn't go on, but the information came to Fox News about this book. And that's why in your opening, when you said, yeah, the public is not on board with this. I mean, that would be mild because I think Old Dominion just got deluged with letters about this young professor, this professor named Walker, and he's no longer at Old Dominion. So if I were teaching the deviants course, I would say, yes, students, (laughs) it seems like this is still deviant today. Because people were just like, oh, this is awful. These aren't minor attractive people. These are pedophiles. But Professor Walker, I mean, he's an impressive guy. He got his PhD from John Jay College, which is the premier criminal justice college in the whole United States. It's a wonderful school. His specialty is queer criminology. And he wants to really (laughs) remove the pejorative label from people who are attracted to children. And I guess that could be a laudable goal, but some of his suggestions are just crazy. His thesis argues that pedophiles should be allowed to view child pornography. Now, that's just crazy. As I said, his specialty is queer criminology, and he is promoting child pornography. Now, I'm sure John Jay College knows that that's illegal just to even possess child pornography, or buy pornography involving children because children are exploited in the making of such pornography. But he thinks that pedophiles should be permitted to view child pornography as a kind of harm reduction technique, just like they give drug addicts free needles and give them shooting galleries now in New York City. That's a harm reduction strategy for drugs. This Professor Walker thinks that as a harm reduction strategy for pedophiles, and he does say, you know, people who would act out on it should be allowed and encouraged to use child pornography. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure the answer to that is obvious, because if we're looking for harm reduction, what about the harm to the, obviously the children involved? Well, I know, and I don't know why. I mean, it's hard to understand how he would get a PhD with that kind of a thesis in his dissertation. Well, it seems like I'm hearing a couple of different points of view when I go out into the fringes of social media. Sometimes I hear an argument like this, where people will say, there are some people who have unwanted thoughts that keep pestering them in their minds that involve intimacy with a minor. And they're not acting on these, and it's a terrible cross for them, but it's happening. And they would be considered pedophiles. Then we have people who go out and engage in these sorts of behaviors in real life. We also call them pedophiles. So I get some people saying, well, look, if these are really uninvited thoughts and these people are genuinely fighting back against them, then that's one thing. But if they were to act on them, that would be quite another. But now we, you know, when we look at not just North American Man-Boy Love Association, but also at, uh, let's say, some of the people who want to just call it intergenerational intimacy or whatever, they seem to be implying, well, even if they do act on it, as long as it's consensual, as if a nine-year-old can really consent to something like this, even that's okay. So it's like there are two different groups here. Oh, there are. Absolutely, there are. Well, the group that wrote, the academics who published this book, uh, Intergenerational Intimacy, they promote the idea that you could act on it and that a seven-year-old would enjoy it. That's what they say in the book. Professor Plummer's book 
says that a seven-year-old has built up an elaborate sexual code, they say. So that's part of the problem. Hey, everybody, let's thank our sponsor, BetterHelp. We're heading into the new year of 2022 very soon. So why not resolve to make that a happy year for yourself by striving to overcome the obstacles standing between you and the happy future you want? There are a lot of problems people might face like depression, stress, anxiety that are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to overcome entirely on your own. And that is where BetterHelp comes in. I know you look on social media and it seems like everybody has a perfect life, so you feel like there's something wrong with you because your life isn't perfect. Well, I'll tell you something. My life hasn't been perfect, and I've used BetterHelp myself. They figure out exactly what you need. They match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can talk to that person over the phone, through video. You can send messages. No sitting in any uncomfortable waiting rooms. No long drives. Not to mention, it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. They've got a ton of great testimonials. And in fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash woods. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash woods. So what should be done with both categories of person? So the first category is somebody who comes out and says, uh, you know, I don't know why I'm overwhelmed with these particular thoughts. I mean, there are people who are overwhelmed with, all, with, with, with thoughts of violent rage, I'm right. sure, and that they have to suppress. To have- great compassion toward them because they're admitting that this is a problem. It's the ones that don't see it as a problem because they're being encouraged not to see it as a problem by this second group who are trying to normalize it. Do you think the editors of the intergenerational intimacy group are telling them, you know, reject these feelings? If they're saying a seven-year-old would love this? No, they wouldn't. So they're not being helped by that group. The first group needs help and they're acknowledging that they need help these are unwanted attractions. They don't want these attractions. So there are ways to not have those attractions, but the ways don't include reading, looking at child pornography or hanging out with other pedophiles. I mean, there's a group called the Danish Pedophile Association where they have meetings and they get together and they all talk about how wonderful this is. <laughs> That's not a good thing. Those are minor attracted persons, but they're pedophiles. In your article, you note that the American Psychological Association in 1998 had an article in its psychological bulletin that concluded that child sexual abuse does not cause harm. And NAMBLA was quick to post what it considered to be good news on its website. Right. The APA, which is their flagship journal there, the Psychological Bulletin, they did a study of college students and they looked at those who had been sexually abused as children and they found that they were resilient and they had been fine. That, you know, it isn't that they were happy they were abused, but it didn't have long lasting effects for them is what the APA said. And now this study has been severely criticized, obviously, not just because of its conclusions, but because of its methods. But it was used by NAMBLA, of course, on their website to tell the good news. And that's the way they put it, good news for man-boy lovers. Now, we're still talking about man-boy lovers. (laughs) Nobody is saying man-girl lovers. They really aren't because that kind of pedophilia is never celebrated. And it's still viewed as very deviant by everyone. But there is a significant segment of the population that views man-boy love as okay. And I have to say, Woman-girl love is also tolerated and sometimes celebrated. Now, I've been on college campuses teaching for 35 years. And for a while, there was a a play called The Vagina Monologues. I'm sure your listeners are familiar with that. It was on almost every college campus, including some Catholic college campuses. And in that play, it was written by a woman who first wrote the play. And there's a seduction scene between an adult woman 27 years old with a 13 year old girl. And she's introducing her to lesbian sex. And it's written as a 13 year old girl. And so it was presented that way for several years as a 13 year old girl with this adult woman. They later raised the age to 16 when they were presenting the play on college campuses because people knew that, you know, it's really illegal to have sex with a 13 year old. But um, 
still that play was very popular and nobody really thought much of it except people like me who notice these things and teach about them in their deviant behavior courses. I noticed them. And but nobody else did. So it's not really a blip on the radar screen when it's woman girl. It just isn't as much as it is man girl or man boy. Woman girl seems to be just fun. I didn't know until you mentioned it just now that you taught a course on deviance and on what society considers deviant, how that evolves over time. Yes, I do. What kinds of things do we learn that are valuable to know? Apart from the details of this is well, this was once considered deviant, now it's normal, and so on and so forth. Are there any are there any large scale lessons we right? Like from in this? my book, every chapter is a it's a different form of deviance, and the way I present the whole course is who's selling this? Because every chapter, every form of deviance, whether it's drug abuse or alcoholism or any kind of deviance you can think of, even smoking. Smoking was once very cool. And then that became defined as deviant. We call that being defined up. And who did that? Well, the Surgeon General, you know, insurance companies, people started getting healthy. So that's what, and driving drunk, I'm very old. <laughs> I remember when people drove drunk and they didn't really get in trouble, even if they had an accident, because we didn't think of driving drunk until MAD came along, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And so they were the people who helped define that up as deviant. Now, the people who are defining drug abuse down now, like in New York City, harm reduction methods, we look at who is doing that, who's selling this new definition of deviance. You know, now we look at drug abusers as victims. You know, they're victims of fentanyl and victims of pharmaceutical companies. We don't look at them as offenders anymore. And I try not to make a lot of value judgments, but I I find the course just fascinating. This used to be a very popular course on all college campuses. It still is on my campus, but a lot of them got away from it. A lot of colleges did because you're not really supposed to call any behavior deviant anymore. You know, it's all subjective in this postmodern world. Nothing is deviant really, except for people like me who think there is deviance in the world. I'm the deviant. That's so true. That's the problem. Yeah, that's right. They don't like the word, but they definitely, let's say, the opinion molders. They certainly like the concept because they're very happy oh, to t- classify whole groups of people. Oh, Trump as, voters. Yeah, yeah, nobody has a problem classifying Trump voters as deviants. Right. Absolutely. Any conservative, anybody who's pro-life, they're the deviants. So I find this area so fascinating. When I was in college, as I said, in the 70s, it was the most popular course on campus. And at Yale, some, a professor from there said, we shouldn't teach this anymore. And he wrote a whole article and it says, the death of nut sluts and perverts. That's what kids used to call that course. It was the course in nut sluts and perverts because you study sexuality, you study perversions, and you study mental illness, forms of mental illness. And so they made fun of it. And so the course disappeared on a lot of campuses. So by the time I wrote my book in 2001, it's published with Encounter Books. I was grateful to them for publishing it, but there were no more courses that really wanted to use it in their course because deviant behavior was disappearing on college campuses. You just couldn't have a a course that called anything deviant. Yeah. Everything's normal now. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. It's, it's, You know, as I say, the word may have disappeared, but the concept is still very much in play. I'm Um, curious because you mentioned with regard to drunk driving, you mentioned, because I remember very distinctly that Mothers Against Driving Drunk, they had a very substantial organized campaign against that. And then, of course, when it comes to gay marriage, well, obviously, again, they were the LGBT community has a very, very significant amount of political organization. So in your study of this, to what extent is the evolution of something being considered deviant to not being considered deviant, to what extent is this something that occurs spontaneously and organically? And to what extent is it is it deliberately driven by an organized group with an agenda? Oh, absolutely deliberately driven. Absolutely. There's big money behind it. There's big thought behind it. There are movers like in the um, 1980s, there was a book called After the Ball. It's out of print. But it was a bestseller at the time. And it was a book 
by two marketers, two public relations gay men who wanted to redefine homosexuality because it was pretty deviant. We had just gotten through the AIDS crisis and people were actually kind of afraid of the gay community. So it was a very difficult time for them. And so they set out what they called a blueprint for acceptance for the 90s. And it was, honestly, it was very well funded. And they identified three techniques of persuasion. And if you look at deviant behavior, almost all deviant behavior, those who are trying to define it down use three techniques of behavior. And the first one is desensitization, where you bombard people with advertising of happy families that are gay and have a gay daughter or, you know, all the people who are gay. That's what they suggested they that people do. And that's what we're seeing now with pedophilia, with these intergenerational intimacy people. Look at how well-adjusted these children are that have had this. The APA tells us they don't have any problems. We need to celebrate that. And the second one is the second technique of persuasion that after the ball suggested is called jamming. And we would call today that cancel culture. We go after anybody. You're nothing better than a Nazi if you don't agree with our new definition. It's jamming. So anytime anybody says anything negative, do you remember Nita Bryant in the old days? Oh, she yeah. It's America. And she said something about Steve can't marry Steve. I don't know. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Yes, yeah, she was she was ridiculed and humiliated and marginalized. She was jammed. Anybody who did anything like that would be jammed. So people like me writing about intergenerational intimacy, I get jammed about this. After I I published several articles about this. And every time I get negative jamming, sometimes they'll write to the president of my university. In the past, I used to be at the University of San Diego and the professor from UCSD complained about it, that I was, you know, lumping too many people together. Yeah, that's jamming. And then the last one is conversion. Once you've jammed enough people, they are afraid to say a word. And then you can, you have conversion. You have, you have everything you wanted. And that's not happening with pedophilia. It gets it gets stuck because they're not going to jam people who don't agree with them on this. But there's enough people who don't agree with them on this. Yeah, this is, as I say, I think this is an area where they've taken a step too far. And if anything, that phenomenon will occur to them. I mean, this is the kind of crime where you regularly hear ordinary individuals without a violent bone in their bodies saying, well, I know what I would do with somebody who did that. Oh, you're kind of absolutely thing. right. And, yeah. and even in prison, pedophiles don't do well in prison. There was a priest, Father Dan from Boston, who had abused many children in his role as a priest in Boston. And he didn't last very long at all in prison. He was murdered almost immediately. Pedophiles are hated even by the hardcore of the hardcore. <laughs> yeah, they are. Well, it's just so interesting to observe this because the left is so, I mean, we have to admit, the left is very, very good at this. It's very good. Oh, they're good at jamming, that's for sure. Well, they're good at that, but they're also good at putting things on the agenda that were really not on the national agenda. I mean, I remember back in 1988, I distinctly recall watching one of the presidential debates and somebody, or it may not have, I'm sorry, I guess I didn't distinctly recall it because I, and now I'm a little confused in the details, but I remember at least reading somebody saying, before you know it, the environment is going to be a significant issue in American political life. And I thought, nobody talks about the environment. That's yeah, not going to happen. And then suddenly, everywhere you look, it's the environment. And then likewise, gay marriage. Now, right. there might have been some people on the fringes in the 1970s who were talking about gay marriage, but not very many, not very many. No, at that point, were. they were talking about a place at the table. There was even a really good book, actually. Michelangelo said, Murillo did a wonderful book called A Place at the Table, and I love that book. It was just like, treat us like you would treat anyone else. We don't want anything except a place at the table. And it was uh, the Clintons. The Clintons said, well, marriage is one man and one woman. And then all of a sudden, the Clintons believed the exact opposite of what they had just said they believed 10 minutes earlier. That is an astonishing phenomenon. Well, that is all driven by money. There's money behind all of that. You look at the orchestra, and that's something I study. I study, you know, foundations that are giving money to redefine deviance. And Arcus is a big one. John Stryker is a huge one. Gill family. There is so much money in this. And so, no, it's not a grassroots thing. It's a money-driven thing. But some people will listen to that, though, and be offended by that. And they'll say, but 
to me, this is a deeply held principle that people who have a tender love for each other ought to be able to express that within the context of marriage. And that's, and to me, it doesn't, money is not driving it at all. Sure. Yeah. But that's not everybody. To get the churches on board, you would have to go further than that. Because you have to be able to reject what your church teaches. And that's much harder to convince people of. And that's why so many people are so resentful of conservative churches, evangelical churches, Catholic churches, who still hold that marriage is sacred and only between a man and a woman. So it's very hard to get that. And the only way you can do that is through, you know, this bombardment of advertising, for one thing you know, nice stories and because there are wonderful gay families. So it's good to have those stories, but you also have to jam and you have to jam religious people. And maybe you don't see it the way I do, but there's a lot of jamming going on of religious people on this issue. Well, I think I recall reading, I don't know what the numbers were, but a poll asking about people about why their opinions on this changed. And for a good many people, their opinions changed because they knew people who were in these relationships and they they liked them and cared about them and yeah. they just couldn't imagine themselves being in the position of saying, you can't have something that will give you happiness and fulfillment and that that's what did it. Yes, that is what did it for a lot of people. But then there are a lot of people who are very religious and go back to their biblical teachings and they can't get there. And they're the ones who are left behind and the ones who you know, they have to stay silent because they know that now not to support same-sex marriage is deviant. So they're the new deviants. I guess my question, and I'm not sure, I really don't know what the answer is, is why is the left so good at this, at taking issues that were, I mean, honestly, if you went back to, again, the early 1980s and you asked anybody anywhere, 99% of people would have said, of course, I don't favor gay marriage. Now, they wouldn't have had a maybe a well-thought-out reason why, but it wasn't being discussed. Now, whether that's good or bad is not even material to our conversation. It's that it wasn't on the table. And then not only was it on the table, it was so on the table that, as you say, it's just expected that everybody now agrees with it. Why does that move in only one direction? Like, Why is it that people who might be philosophically to the right of center can't seem to bring their ideas to the table in such a way as to compel assent to those ideas? Well, because they're conservative. And conservatives want to conserve what's important to them and what they believe is important for society. They're more believers in natural law. Progressives want to progress, <laughs> you know? <laughs> They want things to change. They're unhappy with the acceptance that they have, perhaps. And so they want to convince others that this is progress. This is what we have to do. And in my course, that's what we study a lot. There's so many theories that would help explain. You really have to take my class. (laughs) Um, That help explain how this happens. And conservatives just don't do that. They're wanting to go to the past. You know, William F. Buckley says, I stand a across history and say, stop, you know, stop. And we can't do that. That's crazy. We can't stop history. Progress is going to happen. And we just have to hope to be able to shape it in a way that is acceptable to us. But some people can't do that. And the religious people are the big losers in this right now. Although I think abortion is right around the corner here, this discussion about abortion. And the progressives could lose a little bit here. I just signed an amicus brief in favor of Dobbs. I'm a pro-life person. I'm Catholic. And I think abortion is becoming defined as more deviant than it was a month ago. I mean, a few years ago. You know, this is a form of deviance that was very deviant in the old days. And then it became, you know, a sacred right. And I think it's becoming maybe a little deviant again for even the pro-choicers. Well, we'll see. Where that goes, I I think maybe there is, there are some interesting statistics about the frequency of abortion and people's opinions on it and when they consider it to be, if ever, they consider it to be morally acceptable. Your book, though, The Politics of Deviance, apparently is still in print. It is, yes. And, and, you know, these days, a book from 2004 still being in print is a rarity. I know, thanks. Yes, it is. I just published a new one called The Politics of Envy. And there's a lot of this in there, too, because envy plays a role, too, in the redefinition of deviance. Well, 
I wasn't aware of that. I'll have to take a look at that. Maybe yeah, we'll we can have, talk about that sometime. Tom. Have another conversation, but I'll I'll link to as long as the book is still available. I'll link to the. Oh, politics thank you. Experience. I think you can get it for like a dollar or two on Amazon because <laughs> you know there's uh, a yeah lot with of used ones. yeah right. I mean there is a unbelievable cornucopia of used books at our fingertips these days, given the technology. But, but it is so still I'm going to link. Print. You can still get the hardcover. I think maybe the paperback. I see both of them here on Amazon. Oh, so I'll link to the book. The Politics of Deviance, and I'll link to your article on the postmodern pedophile. Put both of those up. This is episode 2026, so tomwoods.com slash 2026 is where you can find all that. Well, let me check out your new book, and maybe we can have another conversation sometime soon. Okay, thank you, Tom. All right, everybody, remember that the podcast is only half of the Woods experience here. you got to also get the email. You may say, Woods... The last thing I want is more email. Ah, ah, my goodness, child, you haven't seen the Woods emails. If anything, you're going to say, I'm not getting enough Woods emails. Well, I'm doing the best I can. But hop on my list. You're going to get a lot of great material, particularly material that will get you through this insane time we're living through. And you can hop on there right at the top of the screen, tomwoods.com. You'll see a red button Sign me up. You can do that. You can go to chartstheyforgot.com and get my free ebook, COVID Charts CNN Forgot. Lots of great stuff. I give you a nice goodie when you join the list. So go ahead and do that. Make sure you don't, if you're running an ad blocker or something, then you can't sign up for the newsletter. So you got to suspend that temporarily so that you can enter your information and I can start sending it to you. And then you'll say, I am getting almost the full Woods experience here. I'm getting the podcast, I'm getting the newsletter. And then someday, someday you'll take that plunge and say, I belong in that private group Woods has. And then you'll go over to supportinglisteners.com and join that private group and be part of the inner circle that we have there. But one step at a time, hop on the email list over at tomwoods.com or at chartstheyforgot.com or at aocisrong.com. I'm particularly proud of that one. And, uh, and you get a nice ebook because what else do you get from old Woods? You'll enjoy that uh, newsletter. So go do that and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.